what were you afraid of uh, when you were a kid? Um, when I was a kid, the thing that scared me the most were ghosts underneath the bed. What were you afraid of? An incredible hawk. What was it, Marvel comic dude? Spiders, definitely. <laughs> Getting lost. The dark, thunder and lightning. Oh, I hated clowns. They were awful. The dark clowns were kind of scary. Why were you afraid of the Incredible Hulk? I don't know. I guess when he broke out of the clothes, it just scared me. I don't know. <laughs> but that's it. Vampires. I was afraid of the bathtub. Getting sucked down the drain. The dark. Afraid of Kruger. Nightmares. What were you afraid of when you were a kid? The dark. Still am. Unsolved mysteries. Spiders. Mm, vampires. And asparagus. <laughs> when I was a kid? Wow, that's hard. Um, I wasn't afraid of much. I used to have this weird dream, though, that I guess it's the only thing that really made me afraid, but... It was like everything was kind of getting faster. Or... Slower. And then it just keep getting slow. Like, my mom was yelling at me, but it get really slow, like in slow motion, and I'd just wake up freaking out. What are you afraid of now? Uh, I think right now the most, um, the thing I'm most afraid of is not accomplishing anything with my life and just letting my life go to waste. Uh, I guess uh, failure, yeah, that's a good one, and non-acceptance, yeah. Yeah, those are the two main ones. What are you afraid of now? Now I'm afraid of any living organism in water. Um, I'm fine with swimming pools, but if you get me near a lake, the beach, that freaks me out. What are you afraid of now? Are you afraid of anything? Right now? Fell in school, man! <laughs> well, now I'm scared of things more like failure, like not doing well in life and not getting what I need to survive and more important things. What are you, what are you afraid of now that you're grown up? Um, I guess uh, now that I'm grown up is living up to the standards uh, that I've set for myself. I'm afraid of dying. I'm afraid to, not of dying, but actually being killed. I don't want to die that way. I don't want to be killed. So I'm afraid of that. How do you how do you deal with your fears? Then? Sleep with the light on. <laughs> no, I do. You can't see all the bad stuff. I just take it one day at a time, and I don't know. It's hard sometimes, especially right now at school with everything. You no, know, you just have to trust yourself that you'll be able to get it all done. I try to avoid them if I can, um, like with the water. Like right now, if I go to the beach, I'll try to avoid the water. But if I can't, then I pretty much just face it. Um, I like to challenge myself that way. Making sure there's an open dialogue about things that you're scared about. And yeah. as for the spiders, just keeping a really big, heavy shoe in your room. <laughs> I'm afraid of not, fulf not fulfilling a purpose in life. Like, I'm pretty sure like everyone has their purpose in life. And, you know, I'm always trying to find what is my purpose on earth. So that's, that's, my, that's what I am afraid of. How do, you, how do you deal with that? That's a pretty big question. Well, um, first it came with the question of, you know, what's, what are we doing on Earth? And if we had any meaning here? And, and actually, it, it, you know, our lives will be really empty if God doesn't exist. So, um, so that's what fulfills me now, because you know, I know that we have a purpose, because God put us here with a purpose, and that He wants us to do something. So I, I'm just... I just pray and ask for his guidance. Well, good morning, church. So, who wants anybody want to volunteer to come up here and share all your fears? No, nobody. <laughs> well, I, I do this warning every time I preach. Um, it's your last chance to get out. Because I'm going to put Chris by the back door and lock you in here. Dan's not here, so if you don't want to hear me preach, you better leave now. Everybody good? Now we're going to pray real quick and get my mind straight on this sermon. Then we'll talk about when fear steers off our victory. Father, we're so grateful to be in your house. Well, we want to take this time just to humble ourselves before you. To give your word prudence in our life. That what you say from your word would seep into our hearts and our minds and our veins. And that we would be able to live it on a daily basis. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so everybody sort of gets, gets the idea what the sermon's about, fear. Anybody have any weird fears like arachnophobia or claustrophobia or any of those things? I, I'm sort of claustrophobic. I'm not real bad about it, but if you get me under a house and I can't move my arms, I start to get a little weirded out by that. 
Um, some people, there's bugs. Some other people have weird, strange fears. But the fear I want to talk about this morning, the story I want to use is, like I said earlier, Elijah. Now, we all hear the story about Elijah standing on Mount Carmel, calling down the fire of God so many times. How many times has everybody heard that story? Anybody heard, have ever heard that story about Elijah calling down the fire of God from the mountain? But we don't normally hear about what happens next. And that's what I want to focus on now. Right after Elijah has one of his biggest victories in his life, 400 prophets of Baal calls down the Spirit of God in fire, and it burns up an offering. And it's like, see, I told you God exists. Huge victory in his life. Right after that, he has one of the biggest failures in his life. And it's because of fear. So we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 19. Everybody understand this is right after Elijah has this great victory on the mountain. And we're going to start at verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 1. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid. That sentence right there stands out to me. And we'll get to that in a minute. But you know, imagine, he just called God's fire down from heaven, and now he's afraid of one woman. It's probably his ex-wife. No, I'm just picking. Okay, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. <laughs> no, I'm just, when I read it, that's what it sounds like. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. How many of you have had those days? Anybody want to admit to having one of those days? I mean, you just are so fed up. You want to go find a place to lay down by yourself, away from everybody, and... Right? That's what Elijah was doing here. He was having a little hissy fit. So, here's the thing. He had just had one of the biggest victories in his life. I mean, he was alone on the mountain. There's 400 prophets of Baal standing there. And for some reason, they chose not to kill him and let him do the sacrifice. He's taunting the prophets. Do you remember the story? They, could, they kept praying and tried to call fire from heaven, and it wouldn't happen. He's like, oh, pray it again. Maybe he's asleep. I mean, that's some bold action right there. And now he gets this little email from Jezebel, back then it was a messenger sent, was like email to us, or text. Maybe it was more like a text. It wasn't official with the seal on it. That would have been an email. But he gets this message from Jezebel, and he gets all scared and runs away, pouting. So I want to notice a few things that I believe is what caused him to have this reaction. How do we lose our victory is where we're at. How do we lose it? How did Elijah lose that victory? What was going on inside of his head that, all of a sudden, after this great victory, he's scared and he runs for his life. I think the first thing that happened is he believes the lie. And it's the same thing that happens to us. We believe the lie. Jezebel couldn't kill him. If she could, why would she have told him she could kill him? Why didn't she just do it? He believed the lie. This was a lie from Satan. Here's what happens. When we have a victory, Satan realizes that he just lost that battle, so he goes for the person. A personal attack. And Elijah bought it. He believed the lie. How could he not have the faith that God would protect him when he had the faith to call fire from heaven? He believed the lie. Second thing that happens to us, same thing that happened to Elijah, we focus on ourselves. 
He got focused on his self, his ability, his power. You know? What, when he had this victory from the, uh, at the altar, he wasn't focused on himself. He was focused on God. So when he gets this message from Jezebel, he gets, oh, it's me. Oh, woe is me. She's going to kill me. Another thing that happened to Elijah and what happens to us, operate out of our own self-reliance. I mean, if he'd had the faith that he had at that altar, he would have just dropped to his knees and prayed, Lord, please protect me. And the last thing, and this is the one I think everybody misses when they read this passage. This is the one that I think everybody jumps right over when, when they study this. It is, he depended on works, not relationship. Now, where I get that from is, if you'll read later in the passage, when God comes to Elijah, he says, why are you here? Or what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah spews out this big, long, I'm the only one left. I've been working so hard for you. I've been serving so hard for you. And there's nobody else. Uh, that, that's paraphrasing, but that's what it sounds like when he says it. It's just all about me. I'm always doing this for you, and you're not even protecting me anymore. So here's this great, bold Elijah that we hear all these great stories about, that everybody talks about. Elijah the Great. And he's having a pity party. A little pouty session. Now, to get to some of these points, I've got a lot of stuff that I want to cover, so y'all just hang on for a second. We're going to cover the rest of this chapter, not almost the rest of this chapter, but we're going to get to what is God's response to Elijah. And I, the reason I want to get to God's response to Elijah is because it's the same way he responds to us. We're having a little pouty pity party, and we've lost our victory because we're scared of something. And I want to get to these fears that we all face. Maybe we're scared somebody's going to find out who we really are. Not who we are at church. Maybe we're scared that we're not going to be able to put down that thing we struggle with. Maybe it's a pill or a cigarette or um, some kind of addiction. Maybe we're scared that we're not going to be able to make our finances work when we pay our tithe or when we don't cheat on our taxes. Or maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm just naming some things. Maybe we're scared that we have to pretend like we're somebody we're not for other people to like us. Maybe we're scared to not share our faith at our workplace or at school. What is that fear that's got you so scared right now? And I want you to see you have nothing to be afraid of because if we look at the way God responded to Elijah, it's the same way he's going to respond to us in our fears. So what's the first thing God responds to Elijah? He provides for his needs. If you go to 1 Kings 19, 6 through 8, what does it say there? 6 through 8, I'm going to get back to it right here. So all at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over the hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. Some things I want you to notice there. Elijah ran away into the wilderness, lay down by a rock, and he's crying. Please just kill me. What did God, did God say, you sorry rascal, you shouldn't be laying there. I'm so disappointed in you, Elijah. He didn't say that. Now, we might say that. We might treat other people like that. But God didn't. He politely provided some food and some drink. And here's the other thing that people don't notice in this passage. Elijah was running away, but God already knew where he was going because he said, the journey's too far for you. 
where you're trying to go. Here's some food. Here's some drink. The next thing was God's response was he met him right where he was. He meets him where he is. He didn't stop somewhere and say, you need to come to me. He didn't stop and say, you're not good enough right now. You need to get better. You need to do better. You need to make things better before I'm going to allow you back close to me. He was right there with him the whole time. Right in the midst of the whole thing. Right in the midst of the whole fear. Right in the midst of the scared. Right in the midst of the running. He was there beside him, following him, with him, walking with him, taking care of him, feeding him, giving him drink. Now, how many times in our life are we right in the midst of running away for something, but he's still there providing for us, and we don't even see it half the time? That's where Elijah was. He's scared, he's running, but God is still right there with him. That's Kings 19.9. If you want to know where that one was, Kings 19.9. And I'm getting all confused here. There he went into the cave and spent the night after he ate and drank. The next thing that happens is God reveals himself to him. Now this story is too long for me to read. So I'm going to paraphrase this part of the story. So Elijah's running. He lays down by the broom bush. He's crying. Oh, God gives him some drink and some food. And he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? He strengthens him and gives him food. Elijah travels another 40 days. And he's headed to this mountain. Does anybody know what the mountain was? Hereb, I think that's the way you pronounce it. I could be wrong. Was the mountain. Guess which mountain that is? It's the same mountain where God met with Moses. Elijah's going back to the beginning here. God knew where he was going. So Elijah's traveling 40 days into this mountain, to this mountain. He gets to this place, he goes in this cave, and God says, I will meet you there. So Elijah hears this thunder and lightning, but the Bible says the, the Lord was not in the thunder and lightning. The Bible says there's this great earthquake, but the Bible says the, the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then he said, Elijah heard this small voice. And when he heard it, he covered his face and went outside and met with the Lord. So he meets him where he's at. Here's the next thing that God does in response to Elijah's fear. He reveals himself to him through this great, not the thunderstorm, not the earthquake, but through this little Small voice. The next thing that God responds to Elijah was, he hears his prayers. If you go to chapter 19, verse 14, here's that prayer I was talking about. Here's that prayer. And I'm going to read it regularly, and I'm going to paraphrase what it sounds like to me. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. I've done everything you wanted me to do. I'm the only one doing it. How many of you got a kid now, and they get in trouble... And they're hiding somewhere, especially if they're real small. Let's say they're hiding behind the curtain, but you can still see their feet out from under the curtain. You ever had that happen? And they're not crying and pouting yet because they think that you don't see them. But as soon as you turn that curtain back, Wah! has everybody ever had that happen? 
That's the picture I have here of Elijah. He's ran away. He's pouting and he's hiding back behind the curtain. And when God pulls the curtain back, he's I'm the only one. Nobody else. It's like when I tell one of my kids to wash the dishes. And you know I have two kids. Well, Angelo's not, Tina's not washing the dishes. I did it last time. You did it this time. That's the way Elijah is responding to God, to me. I don't know if it's just because that's the way I see things. But that's what it looks like to me. I'm the only one doing anything. The same way, though, that God responds to Elijah is the same way we respond to our kids a lot of times. Sometimes they need, uh, you know, a timeout or a pat on the butt, but a lot of times they just need a little understanding, and they need you to get down on their level and look them in the eye and go, you don't have to be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. What about when your kid's scared from something under the bed? They're about, what, four years old when they start having this fear of the closet. The closet, come close the closet door. You ever have that one? And you have to go in their room. You have to open the closet and shine the light in there. See, there's nothing in there. And you got to get under the bed and shine the light. There's nothing under there. You're going to be okay. And then you give them a hug. And you give them some love. And you say, it's going to be fine. I'm right in the next room. That's God's response to you and me right now. And that fear that's got you so crippled and so scared and so afraid to do what it is he's called you to do, that's his response to you. He's coming down on your level. I find it very ironic that God didn't use the thunder or the earthquake, that it was the small still voice it was like he was trying to remind Elijah it's not about the battles that you've won or lost it's not about what you're doing for me it's about being close to me so close that you can hear my voice that's what's more important So another way that God responds, he heard his prayers, even his whiny little, I'm the only one, prayer. He heard that. Then he gives him direction. If you look at 1915, it says, The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king of Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, King of Nimshi, I knew I would say it right, Nimshi, (laughs) over Israel, and anoint Elisha, the son of Saphat, from Abel Mohem, to succeed you as prophet. So there's a couple things happening here. He gives him direction. Now I want you to note, there's a lot of words, I mean, there's probably some wrong pronunciation in there, but if you read it, you can, you tell me how they're pronounced. Um... Notice he gives him direction. He met him where he was, in the still small voice, and he says, go back the way you came. Now, did God change anything except for Elijah's heart? He didn't kill Jezebel. Now, if if I'm Elijah, I'm praying, please kill Jezebel, because I don't know if I can make it. But he didn't. He didn't kill her. But what he did do was told Elijah, it's okay, as long as you're close to me. You have the strength to go back the way you came. To go back to what I called you to do in the first place. Go back and serve where I told you to serve in the first place. The next thing he does, he brings him help. He says, go anoint Elisha to succeed you. This Back in this day, it would mean that Elisha would join Elijah, and they together would go and serve and be God's prophets. So he provides his for his needs. He meets him where he is. He reveals himself to him. He hears his prayers. He gives direction. He brings him help. 
And the last thing he does is he reminds him that he's not alone. If you look at the last verse, 18, it says, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. You're not alone, Elijah. You're not the only one left. You're not by yourself. So the question this morning is, the same question that God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? Or why are you here? At this place in your life, whatever this fear is you're facing, whatever this problem it is you're facing, what are you doing here? So how should we live in the victory? What are you afraid of? How should we live in our victory day by day? So what are we going to go back and learn from the first? We should expect the lie. Especially after you've won a victory. I'm going to use an example here. Let's say you're struggling with what's a common thing people struggle with? Alcohol or drugs, pornography, coffee. Some people struggle with coffee, prescription drugs. Let's say you struggle with lying or cheating on your taxes or. I mean, you could put anything there that you want to put in that slot. Let's say you're struggling with that, and you win a battle one day. You say, I'm going to go a whole day. I'm going to go a whole day and not do this. I'm going to win this battle. The very next day, you need to expect the lie. The lie is going to be, you can't go another day. Satan's going to tear you down as soon as you wake up. You can't do it. That's what he's going to tell you. And the truth is, God's going to say, yes, you can. You listen for my voice. You bring yourself close to me, and I guarantee you can do another day, and another two days, another ten days, another twenty days, another year, another two years. I promise you can. Because you have my spirit. So the next thing we got to do to live in victory, we got to stay focused on Him and His will. As soon as you get up and start having that pity party, I can't do this. I've been doing this for so long. It's so horrible. Lord, why are you, why are you put me into this? As soon as you let that lie turn into a pity party in your life, you're going to fail. But you got to stay focused on Him. And it's not the thunderstorms. And it's not the earthquakes that he's going to talk to you in. It's not the big stuff. It's not the big battles. So this is where Elijah got mistaken. He was thinking it's the big battle. And politically we're going to win this battle. And then the whole, all of Israel is going to turn back to God. And it's the big battle that I'm going to win that big battle. And when that didn't happen... That's when he had his little pity party. And why? Because it's not the big battles. It's not the big ones. It's the little ones. It's the thought that turns into the action where the battle's won. It's the thought that turns into the sin. It's where the battle's won or lost. It's the little thing. That's why Jesus comes. That's why when God comes to Elijah, he comes in the small voice. It's the little things. It's the little every day, every minute battle that you fight with on yourself. That's where you got to stay close to God. When the thought first enters your mind is when you've got to go, Father, you know I'm having this thought, but you got to take it away from me. I can't do it in my power, but I know in your power I can. The next thing we got to do is we got to give him lordship over our life and live in his strength. Now, the reason I get this point is because up until this point, Elijah, there wasn't a whole lot of thing that changed for Elijah on that K, in that cave. There wasn't a lot of stuff that God changed for him except for his focus on God. He didn't change the situation at all. He, he sent him right back into the same situation. But what changed? The thing that changed was Elijah said, God, I, 
whatever it is, if it means going back to die at the hand of Jezebel, then I'm going to do it. If that's what it takes, if that's what you're calling me to, if that's what you want me to do, if that's the, what you're called, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give you full control. You are Lord over my life. And when we've reached that point, when, when the devil can't take anything else away from you anymore, when he can't threaten you with anything else anymore, when you're not scared of it anymore, God can use you to do some powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. But if, if Jezebel can keep spitting those little lies in your ear and you keep running every time it happens, you're going to spend a lot of time under that tree, under that bush. Wishing that you would die. And the last thing we've got to do to live in his victory is to remember, 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 remember. A relationship is what he wants with you. It's not your works. It's not all the great things you're doing for him. Because here's a flash and a bulletin. I'm just going to say it. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us at all. But we need him. And when we forget that, when we get in that little pity party like, like Elijah got into, like, God, I've been doing all this stuff for you. I've been going to school, and I've been trying to build this church, or I've been trying to do this, or I've been trying to do that. And we start thinking that he needs us. You're destined for a fail. You're destined for it. We've all seen it. How many of you have you seen uh, these great preachers that come out and they're awesome and they're on fire and they grilled, grilled this huge ministry and the next thing you know they've had some kind of moral failure and, and it just spirals downhill. I believe that's where it comes from because they forget about the relationship first. They forget about, it's not about what I am doing for God. Because I, he gave me every power and ability that I even have. So anything that you guys see that's good in me is not me. Do you understand, do you understand that? Because he's the one that created me. And the same with you guys. If there's anything that you're good at, especially if you're better at it than somebody else, it's not you. And we got to remember that it's our relationship with him that he wants from us. Not our talents, not our... But he does want us to use those for his glory. And he wants to be able to take his relationship with you and use you to reach and touch people. But once you start thinking this about you, you've made a big mistake. Because it's got to be about him. So, there's the four steps. We're going to live in victory. So we're going to say over these one more time. Expect the lie. Expect the lie. Expect the lie. In every battle. Every time you win one, you better be expecting Satan to jump on you. Stay focused on him and his will. That still small voice is there every minute of every day. Whether or not you hear it depends on whether or not you're listening. Let me say that again. That still small voice is there every minute of every day. And whether or not you hear it depends on whether or not you are listening. Give Him lordship over your life. You know... You know, we say this thing all the time in a lot of churches, and it's if you just pray this little prayer, then you're saved and you don't have to worry. And that's true to an extent. But God wants more of your life than just a little prayer. He wants total, utter, surrendered control over your everyday 
every minute, every thought, life. And the more of that you can give to him, the more victory you're going to find every day. The less of that you give to him, the more failure you're going to find every day. And last, it is the relationship without a doubt that is more important than anything you can ever do for him. It's just like your kids. I mean, how many of you ever have kids and if they come home and mow the grass and then when you try to talk to them, they go, blah, 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 and go to the room. Would you, are you happy they mowed the grass? Are you more upset? That they didn't even talk to you and walked to their room and didn't even spend five minutes with you. That's how God feels. You come up here and sing and preach. You can go out and, and serve everybody and mow people's grass and give away all your money. And you can do all that stuff and all that stuff's good. But if you don't spend five minutes alone with him a day, how much of it do you think he counts? How much of it do you think he appreciates? He appreciates it all, but are you spending the time with him? Is it a close relationship? Do you hear that voice? So let's pray. Father, we're so grateful this morning of the way you respond to us in our fears. We're so grateful that you are perfect in every way. That when we are facing these fears and troubles and trials in our life that you don't just tell us we're not good enough but you meet us where we're at you provide for our needs that you pick us up you come down to our level and you just ask us to get our relationship back right with you Lord this morning I just ask that in this place you would have allowed each of us to open our hearts and our ears to that voice to that closeness that you are calling us to and that you would allow us to live in those victories, that you would allow us to live in that strength that you provide and that you would help us every day in every little battle that we would stay close to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.